are you? This welcome to the filmmaker conversation uh, as a part of Blackness Revisualized, the Afrofutures Film Festival that has been produced by All Arts T13 in New York. Um, I'm really excited to be here today, really excited about the guests that we have on deck. Um, I'm going to go through and into and then uh, we're going to dive into some questions and we're going to talk about the two films that are kind of our focus for this, this month's conversation. So first up, we have actor Morocco, currently starring on P Valley, correct? And we have writer-director Keith Joseph Adkins, who is also the filmmaker responsible for The Abandoned, one of the films that we're featuring on. We have Seth Shostak, who is with SETI, The Search for Extraterrestrial... Uh, help me, Intelli Seth. Intelligence. Ah, <laughs> uh, ET, right. S-E-T-I, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. We have J Javon Hunter, who is with UC San Diego. He is a bioengineering Sloan scholar. We also have Sir April Mathis, who is the star of Roxy 15, which is the other film that we're gonna be talking about today. So um, first of all, I'm gonna give a little brief overview of the two films. They're both available for streaming right now on allarts.org. Um, Keith's film, The Abandoned, actually screened on WNET. Uh, it's today, right? It's tonight, actually. It's it didn't happen tonight. already. It's tonight. So if you're in the New York metropolitan area, please tune in to Channel 13 and catch The Abandoned live on broadcast. The Abandoned is a short film about five friends who, uh, five guys who are friends who go on an annual hiking trip. And things take a turn when they learn that a change the world. So then they must navigate their interpersonal dramas as well as trying to survive. The other film that we're going to talk about is actually my film. And Roxy 15 is about a, uh, a prodigy, I guess she's, some say she's a high-strung prodigy, um, who bets her future on technology. But when her prized software and comes after her, saving her life's work also means saving herself. So um, we have these themes that we're gonna deal with and we, you know, luckily we're gonna weigh in on some of the themes that are in the film. So sit back and enjoy. And then at the end, we're gonna have time for your questions. So please, if things come up for you along the way, So first of all, I'm going to, my first question is going to be for Keith. Um, what was the catalyst for making The Abandoned? And, and how did you connect to your cast? Talk a little bit about the cast as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I'm one of those people who grew up watching um, reruns of Star Trek, um, Lost in Space, you know, you know um, out of worldly, otherworldly series. Um, didn't really think I had any interest in, in it as an adult. You know, I just thought like something that was just like something that I liked. And films and so many series around sort of like alien invasions and centering white folks. I was like, why are there no black people centered to global apocalypse? Like we are dealing with even extra more, right? Um, so, um, I just had this idea to create this web series um, about a group of friends, a group of black friends. And ultimately there were, it started off with black men and into the storytelling. Um, and I pitched that to a couple of um, sort of high end studio folks. And they all said it was impossible. It says great idea, but it was impossible to have any success with an color, particularly black people. Because they said black people did not watch sci-fi. And I'm like, why well, I know at least 500 black people I could walk up to right now in the streets of Harlem and they will say, all I do is watch sci-fi. So, um, and something I, I, I like to do. And I pulled together some friends of mine. So Morocco 
is someone I've known for, like you said earlier, for quite some time. We kind of came into the game at around the same time. Jamie Lincoln Smith, Billy Eugene Jones, all theater actors, all phenomenal theater actors. Phenomenal, right? Um, and then I asked them, I just called them up, texted them. They were like, they all said yes within seconds. Really what I was trying to do, but they were just game, which I so appreciated. And that's how that all happened, you know? Um, it was really important to me to have a, uh, a story that centered around more specifically when it comes to an alien invasion and the end of the world and what is their POV? How do they unpack their own lives? How do they, what, what, do, what do they think about the world as it's collapsing? Does it matter as things, right? Um, and, and, and I'll say this last thing. So initially it was supposed to be a web series. Um, I had a couple of producers throw all kind of money at me. They fell apart, that all fell apart. I was left with the pilot. Um, which I just sort of like transformed or reshaped into a singular um, short film. And thank goodness that you did. I mean, I'm sorry that the still think, I mean, I've curated The Abandoned. So I wonder if you could tell us, first of all, how, how, does, Dennis, how does, does Dennis feel about having this Achilles heel? And how did you approach portraying this complex, multi-dimensional guy? I mean, a beautiful thing about Keeps writing is he, you know, for any actor to just like, oh, okay, it's it's really right there in the script. So the backstory was easy to create, you know, and, you know, every character that he wrote has a flaw. So you take that flaw and, you know, you examine, okay, what is it like to have this kind of ailment or sickness or whatever? And then you break it down and then you just add it on and layer layer the character that's already layered and you just sprinkle it in. And I like playing flawed characters, you know, because no one is perfect. We're all working through something in our lives at some point in our lives, which which makes you either root for the character, either the character's going to get up, give up or he's going to keep on fighting until he overcomes whatever um, obstacle that's in this place. So for me, it's it's always good to have because like you said, you don't really, when you see actors of color in, in certain types of genres of films, you don't really see their life. You know, they come in, they deliver their lines and they keep it moving. You don't know what their life is like. You don't see their families. You don't know what they're dealing with. So they don't have a whole lot that, you know, so for us as an actor, when you get that kind of meat, you're like, oh, I'm glad to be at this table so I can just, uh, <laughs> you know, chew it up. So I, I enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, like I said, you know, we, we're all perfectly imperfect and you know, we're fighting. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think you, uh, you really like crushed it because I feel like Dennis is one of those characters that brings out a visceral reaction. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you feel like, like you, you know, he's the guy that, you can hate but then at the same time there is undeniable like his humanity is undeniable yeah. and that I think is the thing about villains you know if you want to call them a villain but is that they have layers they are they do have dimensions just like as you said human beings do that's all of us so I'm gonna move on and ask Seth um some questions because you know, this global event happens in the abandoned and it's something that I think people both imagine and fear and, and really speculate about. And I think as time goes on, we have more and more thoughts around this. So first of all, Seth, can you talk about SETI and tell us what the mission of SETI is? Well, the SETI Institute, which is all around me. I'm, I'm, I'm here in California, but Northern California, which is a good thing because the aliens seem to preferentially want to destroy Southern California, which is okay, <laughs> okay by me. I mean, I don't care if LA gets flattened, it's all right. But uh, if, yeah, the, the SETI Institute is a nonprofit research organization. So we have about a hundred scientists here and they're interested in life in space, but almost all of them are looking for life in space that isn't deep space. It's just our own solar system maybe on Mars, some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So that's what most of them do here. They're, as I say, roughly 100. There's a small group, it's only small for reasons of finance, uh, that's interested in the kind of television or in Keyes films, although you don't actually...
uh, yeah. So that's that's the the group that I've been a part of, which is to say, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And by the way, intelligence means you can build a radio transmitter. That's that's all we ask. They don't have to write po poetry. <laughs> So in recent years, um, very recent years, the U.S. military has taken this shocking step of acknowledging and investigating contact between military personnel and what they call UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena. So, you know, we've seen the release of tapes from the Navy where there are these crafts and we hear the military people kind of wondering like, what the F is this or what the blank is this? Um, has, have these disclosures changed SETI's work at all or, or influenced it at all? Or is this what you were already doing? No, it's not what we were doing. And it hasn't changed anything except for the fact that now people will come up to me at parties and occasionally, you know, volunteer some conversation. They never did that before. So I, I guess there's that. But, but, but Celia, Celia I, I know this is going to disappoint everybody, but I don't think the aliens actually are visiting us. One out of three Americans think that's true. One out of three. So 100 million of your fellow Americans think that we're being visited. The aliens are here either to, oh, well, as I already suggested, uh, you know, flatten L.A. or go on to abduct you for experiments your mom would never have approved of. So that's, uh, you know, that's the popular point of view. The release of these videos, you know, it wasn't that they were secret, actually. None of that was secret. But the military is interested in anything that's flying around our airspace for obvious reasons. So they're going to look at it. And they're very cagey about what they tell you about those invest investigations because, you know, they involve the capabilities of our military aircraft, the Navy fighter jets. And so, you know, they don't want to sort of tip their hand to potential adversaries by saying, well, it had this kind of camera and that kind of camera. Uh -huh. So they're, they're kind of cagey. But honestly, I think if we were being visited, you would know it. I mean, you know, ask ask the people down in Mexico, the, well, ask the, the Incas down in Peru, hey, do you think you're being visited by Europeans in 1535, you know? There was no doubt in their mind about that. I see, I see, I get you. Um, well, we, we'll come back, we'll come back to that for sure. Uh, so April, let's talk a little bit about Roxy 15. And for the audience, I wanna, I wanna sort of specify that the kind of prodigy that Roxy is, she is a virtual reality programmer. So she's, um, she's creating virtual reality that she's going in, in and out of herself as she works on it. So Roxy is, uh, she's brilliant, but she's also a very tough cookie. And for you, what what did Roxy want for herself? And, and in all the stuff that she was dealing with, how does she keep her eyes on the prize? I think uh, what you see about Roxy is that she's really smart and quick. And so uh, a lot of times people like that don't have a lot of time for the niceties and politeness, like, you know, she shows up late to her meeting with the execs or whatever, the people behind the desk. Um, and uh, it's like, she, I think like a lot of uh, programming egghead intellectual type folks would rather just be working on their, their project. And I think she is obsessed with the learning module and, um, that's kind of like the most important thing that she sees for herself. She, she works in this bar and she has to deal with like gross people, like, like the guy who harasses her uh, on the other side of the bar. Um, but, you know, she, she can handle herself, but, you know, she, she doesn't want to have to have a day job. She wants to be able to uh, do this work that she knows that she's capable of doing. Now, whether she can get it done in the, the time frame that is demanded of her is, is mind um, exploding and uh, frustrating because I think she wants to get this right. And uh, um, that's, that's, that's where part of the frustration comes from. Um, but uh, yeah, she's, she's someone who is obsessed with um, the possibilities of the mind. And uh, I think uh, she just wants that direct connection to be able to um, explore what, what this kind of program can do. 
That's so funny hearing you say that, um, you know, talk about her obsession and her relationship to her day job. I just, it's just sort of hitting me now how, how much of a, of a thing that is such familiar territory to creatives living in New York. I mean, that was all of us, right? It's just like you, you have this day job to pay rent and pay bills, but you really just want to do your thing. That's, that's really funny. So I have another question for you then. Is technology friend or foe? And if you could immerse yourself in a virtual world, would you do it? Why or why not? Um, I fact, and I've been thinking about let's let's keep doing Zoom when we need to, and it's great because it's it can be national and international. Um, but I'm also a parent. And uh, we think a lot about screen time and like our children to attach to technology. But I think I can hold in my head that it is um, a natural extension of human consciousness. That being said, um, do I not need to go outside and put my feet in the ocean? No, of course I want like tangible things. I, I, I miss traveling. I got to travel to France this month and that was glorious. And, you know, it just makes the wanderlust like everything's still here. I want to go to it. You know, um, there are advantages to living in a virtual world. Like I can kind of curate what you see and, um, you know, like, do I have pants? No one knows. No, no one's going to find out, you know, um, but um, yeah, I think, I think, I think it's a tool that's, that has a purpose. And then hopefully we don't destroy the, the tangible world enough so we can in, enjoy it because it's nice. Yeah, I guess it's like fire, right? It's, you can use it to heat yourself up and stay alive or you can use it to burn everything down. Hopefully, yeah, we make the right choice. Um, so I want to I want to talk to Javon. Um, we have Javon Hunter, who is a PhD candidate and researcher at UC San Diego, who is working in the area of bioengineering. And Javon, in Roxy fifteen, we have this situation where basically the software that the main character is working on becomes infected with a virus. And so that came from me being interested in virtual space ver versus physical space. And where is that interface? Like where do they kind of come together and overlap, et cetera. And so that's why I wanted to have a, bi a bioengineer on board to talk to us. But first let's hear about your journey to this, to this field. How did you, why did you become a bioengineer? What was the spark for you? Uh, sure. Thanks, Celia. Um, well, so bioengineering, I had no idea what it was. Um, so I'm country boy, small town Mississippi. So that's why I'm pretty hyped to be on here with somebody who's starring in Pea Valley. But um, yeah, I grew up in small town Mississippi. I was graduating from high school in 2012, actually. So um, <laughs> I got a brochure from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and I saw biomedical engineering as a uh, degree um, choice. So I was like, I don't know what that is. I've heard of mechanical, I've heard of aerospace, you know, all the standard engineering that you'd hear of, but you never heard of biomedical. So it's like, what do I do with this? How do you find out how to get into this? I don't know any black people that do this, so what, you know, what is this about? Uh, so when you think bioengineering, biomedical engineering, I think I probably was in the same uh, thought process that you might have been in, Celia, uh, thinking of things like prosthetics or neural interfaces and things like that, where you're interfacing the body or anything biology uh, with technology. So I thought that was really cool. And I was like, I don't know anybody who does this, so why not take that leap to try to attempt it? Um, so I finished up my studies in Birmingham uh, and decided, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in the healthcare side of this. So again, biomedical engineering, 
Uh, and I wanted to work on things like heart failure. So people, heart attacks are the number one killer <laughs> of people throughout the uh, world, not even a nation. So I was like, how do you actually go and engineer the body such that it heals itself uh, from these uh, damages that happen or, you know, damage that happens to the heart after some type of ischemic damage or like heart attack. Uh, so ended up working in tissue engineering. So I'm a bioengineer with a focus on tissue engineering where you engineer the human body's tissues or you have a focus on regenerative medicine to get the body to regenerate itself. So currently I'm using uh, a natural material uh, made out of pig hearts, ironically. <laughs> um, and we can take that material that we take from this pig heart and turn it into a hydrogel. So think of something like Jell-O, uh, inject that into the heart and we have some data that does show that these patients were uh, mitigating their heart failure. So they were still progressing, but not as badly. So you were prolonging, you know, giving people better qualities of life or prolonging uh, the progression into heart failure. So of course we know the total cure for most heart failure is heart transplant. So if we can get some type of regenerative therapy to kind of help us uh, not be as reliant on heart transplants, I think we can save a lot of lives. So that's what got me interested in bioengineering, biomedical engineering. Uh, you asked another question, uh, if you mind repeating it one more time. <laughs> I, I just asked what was the spark for you, but that, your answer, mm -hmm. wow. I'm sitting here like blown away. That's amazing. And I remember when you first told me the specifics of what you were working on, um, you gave me like this, you know, real quick sort of summary, which was already amazing, but this is just like kind of mind blowing actually. Um, so in your view, then I kind of asked you this before, but in your view, how close is science to creating um, a digital replication of human cells? So as far as a uh, digital replication of human cells, I don't think it's that far off. Uh, we digitally digitally replicate biology all the time. Uh, think about artificial intelligence and such. Uh, even though to me, that's more on the computer scientist side and I didn't spend much of my time on that <laughs> side of studies. But yeah, we definitely, if you think of things like artificial intelligence, uh, if you want to think about your DNA is practically computer code, if you want to think about it in a sense, your DNA programs your, well, your DNA is the code for which your cells create proteins, which in turn create the rest of what's happening in your body. So it's, if you're working with a code like DNA, I'm almost certain that we're not too far off uh, from being able to digitally replicate um, human cells or even, you know, cells altogether. Wow. Okay. Hold that thought, please. <laughs> and so I'm going to go back to you, Keith. Um, as, I mean, you work a lot and you do a lot of work um, at a very, very high level. As a Black entertainment professional, what do you prioritize right now? Whoa. Okay. Um, that's a really good question. Um, right now as opposed to what five years ago or yeah or or maybe at the beginning of your career got it well you know <clears throat> um i think at this point what's really important for me particularly you know because i've worked in television um and also f some film capacity but when i'm being interviewed for example for a television series um and more often than not there is some sort of cultural element to that series that I'm sort of set up to meet with these people because I'm black or there's some element of the storytelling that's gonna be a black person or something like that, right? So for me, it's very important that I enter that space knowing that the people involved in creating this show have a real high regard and understanding about the complex black experience. Like it's really important to me that I'm not walking into these spaces having to be an educator, um, having to be the person that they push the button and say, okay, Keith, now speak, we're talking about the black storyline. Um, that to me is extremely important because it happens often. Um, and also with um, black story, like it's a very important for me 
if I'm being interviewed for a black story or black series, that there's also a level of high regard for complexity as well. Because often you also walk into black spaces and it's sort of two dimensional. We're only gonna focus on class. We're only gonna vilify the rich, you know, things like that. And for me, it's very important that I'm gonna be a part of something that humanizes people, humanizes black people. If we're not necessarily centered to the storytelling that when we are present, that we are three dimensional, we react to things, we have, PO, we have a POV that is potent um, which is what, you know, sort of Rock was talking about earlier as far as the abandoned, like, one of the reasons um, I even wanted to, like, put Black men together in that, uh, in that film was because there was a lack of three-dimensionality in sort of Black character in many, many things. And, you know, they're usually killed in the first five seconds, or they're, like, holding the hand of the main character to the very end, and then they risk their own lives, you know, for the white cause or the white future, you know? Um, and so for me, like, it's really <laughs> hyper important um, that I step into any space or even in my own work and I'm doing three-dimensional examination of our people because we are here and we have been three-dimensional from day one that way. Answer the random. It's like it, I feel like these were some dudes that I met like growing up or, or in college or something like that. It's like oh, I, I can relate. I feel comfortable. And I mean, it didn't. They didn't have to be like you know, lower class, middle class, upper class. You couldn't tell. And well, you, well, you could hear what some of their professions were. But regardless of all of that, you could tell these were just like four normal dudes in the car just shooting it with each other. So I, I, I just wanted to come in and say thank you for that. I really like that part. Oh, cool. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to ask Morocco then, we're going to shift a little bit. Can you tell us, based on your observations and your experiences, how do you think that men's friendships are different than women's friendships? And then also, regardless of gender, what does friendship mean to you? Wow. Um, I, I don't know if I'm able to answer the difference between men friendships and, and women friendships. You know, it's in regards to friendships, I believe that, you know, they're, they're like, they're family members, you know, you, you collect, like I collect beautiful souls and spirits, you know what I mean? And if I vibe with you, then you're my family, you know, um, we argue, we debate, you know, we we hold our friends accountable and we defend our we defend our friends in private you know no matter how wrong you are i'm gonna tell you you're wrong you know because you're my you're my brother you're my sister you know what i'm saying so the dynamics for friendship isn't really for me a, a gender thing because i have beautiful uh friends that are women as well as men you know and we can hang we can go you know uh sit up and talk politics, uh, traveling or whatever, you know, so it's, it's not really like, I think friendship goes beyond gender in my case, you know, um, and like I say, I just, um, you know, you, your vibe, your vibe attracts your tribe, you know, it's, it's one of those things. And sometimes we grow out of friendships, you know, the friends that I grew up in Chicago. So, you know, there are friends that I, I grew up with that, you know, we, we barely speak, but when we do, it's like we catch up, but we've grown differently, you know, but uh -huh. that was a, that's a chapter in your life, you know? And I mean, then there are friends that I grew up with that are still my friends today. Um, I, I once, once, you know, I, I went by my old neighborhood and, and some friends jumped out and I was like, oh, Oh, you know, like <laughs> they were, they were kind of hardened, man, hardened by life. You know, I, I saw the guns and I was like, Hey, what's, how y'all doing? You know, like, you know, like, um, but when you grow up, like growing up on the West side of Chicago, it's that's, that was my normal. And, uh, luckily I, I kind of, uh, transitioned, I, 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 you know, 
through life, you take your path. We all have a path in life that we take. And we, like I said, you collect different friends along the way. And, and you, you know, you just, you know, some of us grow and some of us don't, you know, so I, I can't, I can't really answer how male and female friendships differentiate because I, I can only speak from my, my point of view. Right on. I'm with you. I mean, actually, and I love your truth telling because you're right. Some, some people grow, some people don't. And it's just, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Uh, hopefully, hopefully a lot of people heard you and <laughs> will be thinking about that. You know, that friendship, that connection is like chosen family. Right. Um, April, I want to ask you about craft and about acting. I know that you do a lot, lot, lot of theater. And I wanted to ask you, first of all, how, why did you become an actor and how or have your feelings about the craft changed since you first started? And would you do another sci-fi film? Yes, I would do another sci-fi film, please. Can I do another <laughs> sci-fi film, please? Um, I, uh, I'm also a country girl from Texarkana, Texas. And um, it was kind of mind blowing to me that, that you could do this as a living because I didn't grow up seeing that. Um, uh, my mom was a nurse. I grew up in a family of teachers and my, my grandfather was a, a chemist um, um, and a mathematician. Um, and I, I grew up in the church Black Southern Baptist Church. Um, and so the only kind of performance I saw was really like uh, gospel singing in church, which which I didn't feel like I had access to because that was about some kind of like um, ecstatic expression of uh, a religious experience. And if I if my performance didn't look like that, then I guess I'm not a performer. But, you know, uh, as a child, I was very creative. I would make up stories. I would uh, record um, like TV shows, like made up TV shows, made up sermons on like cassette tape and do different voices and things and, um, you know, um, have really elaborate play with my Barbie and Michael Jackson dolls and like soap operas. So, you know, I was a, I was a generative kid, uh, an improv improvisational kid. And, uh, you know, my family would improv with me. We would like imitate racist cops and stuff, you know, but we didn't think of that as like, and this is called improv. And so you need to join a sketch group, you know, like that wasn't a thing that we took seriously. Um, so it wasn't until I got into college uh, that I really started thinking about it and uh, started doing community theater because it was available to me. And uh, from there, I made the move to New York and started doing more. Uh, theater, and then, you know, some television and film. Um, but um, I guess how my thoughts have changed um, is that um, I, I do have a, a bottom line. I'm, I'm an adult. I'm not, uh, I think, I think there's a misconception that actors are like perpetual children and free spirits and they would do it for free. And um, they, they're not uh, professionals and they're not adults and they don't deserve a living wage unless they are a famous person in Hollywood. I don't think people have the concept really of the yeoman actor who um, might not be a household name, but they work. And they're on this show for a while then they're not on a show, then they're on another show or they're doing theater somewhere. Like there's a way to make a living as an artist and you might never be a household name, but you can put your kids through college. You can like buy a home, you can buy your mama a home, you know? Um, and uh, I, having been in this business for 20 some odd years, um, I have, a deep respect for the profession as a profession and, um, and for myself uh, as a craftsperson. Um, 
I was an English major in school because I, I didn't study this, and I think that has served me well. I think um, the kind of actor I am is a, a generative interpreter of work. Um, um, I feel like my acting is is kind of authorship in a way. And uh, I think, yeah, it's just, it's not this thing of like, oh, I just, I'm dramatic. And that's why I'm an actor because I love drama. No, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's an intellectual pursuit of understanding human experience and uh, observe, uh, observing human behavior um, and uh, accessing it. Um, and so I just, I, I just have like a lot more respect for, for that work. I think, I think that's the biggest change for me. And so I wanna, the kind of work that attracts me is work that acknowledges uh, that intelligence that, that we bring as artists. That's funny because, you know, April was in um, two of my short films, one of which was kind of the first, um, it wasn't the first short film that I did, but it was the first like sort of what felt to me like a real production. And I didn't know you before that. And I, but I had a sense even then, I don't know if you were doing theater, I guess you maybe you were, you said you started in community, but I didn't know that about you, but I did get that feeling. I, ha I totally had that vibe from you, which is really interesting to hear you say this. Um, so speaking of acting, Seth, I want to ask you, as you're an astronomer and as a scientist who works, you know, with the stars and the cosmos, first of all, were you um, or are you familiar with Afrofuturism at all? And then more broadly, um, what are your thoughts on science fiction as it exists today, like the current state of science fiction, and what is some sci-fi that you like, if any? All right. Well, first, and I, I guess just a confession, I did not know anything about Afrofuturism. And when I told uh, people, including some who are in this room, as I speak to you, that I was going to be on this panel, their first question was, why you? And I have no good answer for that. So <laughs> that's as far as science fiction goes, I mean, you could say that I'm actually sitting here because of science fiction. I was a great fan of it. Uh, every weekend, my parents would, uh, you know, drive me down to uh, the movie theater in Alexandria, Virginia, and I would, uh, you know, watch uh, aliens land and do whatever they were going to do. And in fact, it was, uh, to me, very obvious that they were all following the same basic script outline. So by age 11, I, I, with another guy, we started making science fiction films. So I've actually done that. Uh, nothing shot in 35 millimeter, nothing shot in, you know, HD or uh, 4K or anything like that. These, these were all eight millimeter and eventually 16 millimeter. And we, you know, we'd, we'd make these sci-fi films and they were all parodies because we learned right at the beginning that people were going to laugh at the films no matter what we were trying to do. So we figured if they were going to laugh, why don't we make comedies? So we did that. But as, 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 as this is all personal stuff. Nobody cares about this stuff. Even my brother doesn't care about this stuff. But I, I will say that uh, eventually, uh, well, I think that sci-fi is very influential. There is that. And as far as what sci-fi is, you know, it's been said in sci-fi, the hero is the story. It's the really the idea because, you know, you can think back to these sci-fi films that I saw as a kid, right? This was just when they were still uh, being made by Edison in Northern New Jersey. Uh, it, it, you know, they would have... Uh, you know, some sort of storyline, but it was always, there was always something clever about the storyline. You know, somebody makes a mistake and terrible things happen, or, you know, they're, they're just going for a weekend with their buddies and suddenly, you know, the aliens start making them disappear for reasons that are never terribly clear. So that's, you know, it's the idea of what's happening. And uh, I, that, that's true. I, I would see things like, uh, there was a guy by the name of George Powell, who was making films in the fifties. And he was a puppeteer from Hungary, as a matter of fact, and, you know, he was a, a puppeteer. He was a performer there. So, but he knew how to, of course, you know, get scenes to work and stuff like that. And he would take on the kind of classic sci-fi themes of, you know, what happens if Earth goes bad? Can we escape? Can some people escape and other people don't fit on the, the rocket ship and that kind of thing. Uh, but mostly it was about, indeed, aliens who come to Earth and have some interaction. And almost always it was a malevolent interaction, but not necessarily. 
I mean, there were some films where the aliens actually came down and helped. And then there was one other category, and that was, uh, you know, it was the atomic age. There was a time when atoms were, or the atomic, uh, the atom atomic physics was going to be the future of us, right? You remember that? And uh, atoms for society, atoms for peace, atoms for this, that, atoms for, you know, whatever. And so, but the, the, the movie industry saw this kind of development is actually very malevolent. And they would start the film with some ato atomic test in Nevada. Uh, there was a guy, uh, what's his name? Arnold, I think of his first name. Anyhow, he was the one who demonized the deserts, right? You know, when I was a kid, the, the aliens were interested in, you know, destroying Manhattan, right? Which, you know, just makes more parking for people who live in New Jersey, I suppose. But they, you know, they, they took on the cities of the East Coast, right? But this guy moved all the action to the deserts of, uh, of the West. And I think uh, Jack Arnold was his name. And I think part of it was that, you know, it was cheap to shoot there, but there was something else. And that was the desert, you know, was kind of empty and terrible things could happen there. And if you had an atomic death, maybe it would cause mutations in ants that are running around the, the ground. And they turn out to be eight, uh, ants that are eight feet high at the shoulder. And of course, what do they do? They immediately fly to Los Angeles, invade the sewers and begin to ruin everybody's day. They, they, these were the kind of stories that I grew up with. And they were very simple stories. They were very simple stories, but they, they explored a possibility that you weren't likely to see in your life. So, so then can I ask you really quick, what is, is there anything in sci-fi now that you like? Any film, any TV series? Well, I still go to the sci-fi. I haven't been to movies in more than a year now, but uh, I still try and go to all the, <laughs> the sci-fi films I can. Actually, I even write reviews of them for various publications. And uh, we, we saw The Arrival again, or I think it's just Arrival without The Arrival. Article. Arrival, mm -hmm. yeah, right. The aliens come down and, you know, the, uh, the characters try to teach them English or something like that. And, and, you know, they, they look like giant squid, actually. Um, in fact, I, I worked out, you, you could get. And, you know, they had this ability to travel in time and all that. But the, the real point was that they came down and they weren't going to destroy things. So that was new. Uh, also. Uh, the one made in South Africa, District 11 or 9 or some district, right? I think it's District 9, I believe. District 9, yeah. I remember I happened to be in South Africa, actually, just before the film came out. And everywhere were these ads for District 9, and they were very clever about it. They didn't tell you what the film was going to be about. But anyhow, so these seafood creatures come down. Once again, seafood creatures. And, uh, you know, that was a different take. So I like it when they have a different take. And I also have to say, again, when I was a kid, you know, the scientists in these films were short little bald guys in a white lab coat, always trying to save the creature, right? Whereas, you know, the sexy looking guy who was usually a reporter or something like that, you know, the guy who got the woman at the end, he was always saying, no, we've got to destroy it because otherwise it's going to take on, I don't know, you know, Park Slope or something. I mean, it's going to do terrible things, right? And uh, so that's a refreshing change because today, Often the scientists are actually the heroes. Right. This is true. This is true. And to just, you know, I'm sure that you did a little research, but in essence, I mean, Afrofuturism means many things to many different people, but it is essentially a, a genre of storytelling and, and other dimensions as well, but within the creative realm where Black people are not only present in the future, but are determining their futures. And there are many, many different expressions of Afrofuturism, depending on, you know, as many different expressions of sci-fi as there are. I mean, there are many different subgenres. And so with Afrofuturism, depending on where someone lives, what their culture is, you know, may, perhaps their generation, it means many different things, but this idea of agency for okay. Black characters, because for so long, particularly in the United States, we can say for sure, when we see stories of the future, you know, Black people and other people of color are, are not, were, have not been present traditionally. And, you know, obviously Star Trek was a huge, you know, was a huge exception to that rule. So with that, I mean, we're, we're going to, soon go to questions from the audience, but I do want to go, I do want to go around and ask everyone um, 
a particular question. So I'm going to go back to, to Morocco. Um, what is your first memory of Afrofuturism or of sci-fi and or sci-fi? I mean, of course, like, you know, television. Um, but I was doing a play in Chicago and, and, and this woman brought me this book by Tanana Reeve Du, uh, My Soul to Keep. She's like, oh, you can play this character, play this character. I'm like, oh, this woman's trying to flirt with me, man. And thank you, sister. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just that whole actory, like, yeah, you know, I did my thing on stage, you know. <laughs> but she kept like, she kept at it. She's like, did you read the book? Did you? She came, she saw the play like three times and she kept asking me, did you read the book? And I was like, nah, nah, I read the book. I don't have time. I'm on this, I'm still on this, you know, script, you know, just, you know, studying the script. So I finally opened the book and I was like, oh, I was blown away. And this had to be late 90s. And I was blown away. And uh, I read about, you know, because she has Lali Bella Ethiopia. And I was like, oh, I got to see this place. You know, it had me researching the stone churches of, uh, of Ethiopia. And I was like, I got to I got to go see it. I had and I was fortunate enough to go and see the stone churches of Lali Bella in like 2014. But I was like how she incorporated all this history and this, you know, immortality. And I was just blown away by it. And uh, I think, you know, Keith, we need to kind of do this as a series or something like that. I'm just going to hey, put it out there. Here first. Um, but, no, I know Tanana Reed. We all know Tanana Reed, most, most of us. Have yeah, yeah. And I, I, it, it's just, it was exceptional. And, and you know, you just you kind of fall down the rabbit hole of that. And, you know, um, so that, that was my introduction to it. Okay, and I'm going to ask you really quickly, what would you do if there were an alien invasion? Man, hopefully I have a great bottle of tequila and I can offer shots. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? You know what I'm saying? Like, what are you going to do? Right? Well, uh, what do you, I mean, really, what, do you, what do people think they're going to do? Like, you know, so it's just like, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm ex-Marine. I served in the war. It's like, if, if they come down, what are you going to do, man? Realistically, we can say, oh, I'm gonna do this and that. You just like, yeah, all right, cool. Yeah. Good answer. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Javon and ask you the same couple of questions. One, what does Afrofuturism and or sci-fi mean to you? And what would you do if the aliens came to San Diego right now? Um, so, well, with Afrofuturism, uh, as you mentioned before, it's actually seeing people or well, Black people uh, in spaces, um, in, you know, sci-fi realms and futuristic spaces, period. I mean, if you think of the Jetsons, they thought we'd be in the sky or something, year 2000, blah, blah, blah. But the future changes all the time. So you have to think about how we as a people end up changing too. And guess what? We're not just dying off. We'll be there. So yeah, that's what Afrofuturism kind of means to me, what we will be doing, how we'll be taking those spaces, how we'll be influencing spaces uh, in the future realm. So that's kind of what Afrofuturism means to me. Uh, obviously, I like sci-fi. Nerdy kid. I'm a scientist. Uh, <laughs> I think the first sci-fi films and things I can remember, of course, Jurassic Park or Deep Blue Sea is one of my favorites. Um, so yeah, I can remember a lot of creature-centric sci-fi films. Uh, so yeah, I do definitely recall thinking of a lot. A few of my favorite recently that kind of tie into the whole Afrocentric thing theme are like Lovecraft Country uh, and the Watchmen series that they did. I really hate that both of those were canceled because I enjoyed both of them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's recent as those two have been my favorite. Uh, as Morocco yeah, mentioned, <laughs> yeah, as Morocco mentioned, what are we going to do? Like, I would love to be in Mississippi and ride it out for a little bit. Cause you know, they're going <laughs> to hit us last. Uh, they're like, oh, I didn't even know there was a spot. Uh, we might, you know, we might make it. They say we forgot Mississippi was there, but no, since I'm here, I'll probably, you know, the ocean's right there. Give me a shot of tequila, pull up a lawn chair chill out until <laughs> right on um so i'm gonna ask april the same the same couple of questions what does afrofuturism mean to you uh and or sci-fi and what would you do um if the aliens land on new york city okay i've been thinking about this 
Um, Afrofuturism to me is just a way to think about um, the black narrative without trauma and without like the Western narrative of oppression. Like, um, and a lot of it does refer back to like ancient African mysticism and um, like um, things like cosmology and, and those kinds of beliefs that um, a lot of us, and I mean me, did not learn in school and, and you know, don't really have a reference for. Um, and, uh, you know, like, I, I just think recently about people thinking like, oh, the pyramids must have been built by aliens because like Egyptians could never. It's like, well, what do you know really? And what, where does that assumption come from? Um, but um, yeah, there's, it, it, it's, it's something that feels like an opportunity to rewrite what this means. And um, that can be as broad as your imagination. And it, it, it doesn't have to be into these Western tropes of like an alien with a funny hat on, you know, and or a funny nose or funny skin. And he's going to try to get you. It's like, what are you? Like, what is consciousness? What is the universe? Like, it, it just explodes um, thought about uh, life and, and, and the universe in a way that's just thrilling and freeing and doesn't, doesn't have the, like, codified rules that we're interested in. Uh, that we're used to, and it is, doesn't have to be linear. It can be any shape. It can be any direction. It can be multi-directional. And um, Celia, you've actually introduced me to more of like the short films uh, uh, in like screenings and things that we've done. Uh, and it's just, it really is mind blowing in the most, um, I would almost say literal sense. Uh, it's just, not there it can it can be anything and that's think, what's so freeing about it yeah i think when you sort of take away all of the assumptions that in the west that we have about otherness and what otherness is because if we t if we're talking about intelligence from outside of this solar system or outside of this planet even whatever this sense of otherness is is absolutely irrelevant it is just absolutely moot. So, and I think that's a huge thing um, because it's been so ingrained. Um, so tell us really quick, the invasion. Okay, I, I've learned in the last year and a half, listen to scientists. So I think we would get very interested in the person who, if they're crustacean-like, who are the crustacean experts? Let's listen to them and, um, you know, I, I, it's real easy for me to get existential. So I would just be in my existential place with like, what are we trying to learn? And, you know, why, why do we assume malevolence? You know, like what, what can this exchange be? How can we be useful? What makes us think that we're superior intellectually or otherwise, or like in the importance of the universe anyway? Like, what is that about even? Um, maybe this is like the universe taking care of itself, but like now here's this other thing that's going to be defined in its own image. So um, I would just uh, be really kind of open and listening and maybe also become a bunker homesteader and like um, pray and um, get like a large collection of wine. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan actually. <laughs> um, Keith, can you, can you talk to us a little bit about um, what Afrofuturism means to you and also what you would do in the event of this momentous arrival of extraterrestrials? I'm glad it's momentous. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I have so many things to say. Oh my God. But I will say this. I will say that um, Afrofuturism which I think what April was sort of tapping into 
um, has been around forever, right? And I think in particular, for me, it's, I'm looking at it through the lens of a new world black experience, being a descendants of enslaved people in this country. And even like earlier on, the mysticism that they brought across that middle passage, passage showed up in churches where they were able to transport themselves spiritually out of the trauma that was around them and find this other place in the future or either in the past that sustained their complexity, right? Um, so to me, it's like, that's how I'm looking at it. And that's what I think about often. And that's why I think for me, like sort of new world storytelling is about like returning to that original pure mysticism that sort of place where we were complex, where despite challenges, despite you know um, imperfections, which Morocco was talking about earlier, there was still a sense of paradise, right? That we were all sort of like informing the paradise by our complexity. So for me, like um, after futurism, and I thank you too, Celia, um, because I think that you are one of the major custodians right now that is keeping after futurism in the minds and in, on, on the screens, right? Like, so I, so I so appreciate you for that. And I think it's also important that, you know, um, Stephen was mentioning sort of like the old sort of templates of how sci-fi existed. And I think that's another reason why after futurism is so important is because we were absent in those, we weren't even thought about. In fact, there's some theory and documented theory that we, Black people were alien. We were the aliens in the imagination of whiteness during that time, right? I think Toni Morrison talks about that, um, other people. And so for me, um, people like Tanana Reed Du, who was writing horror and sort of, you know, sci-fi, um, N.K. Jameson, who is the sort of new um, Black sci-fi person, and like, for example, like um, I'm lucky enough, thank God, and I can't say too much about it, but I am developing one of her novels for, um, for you know, you know how to do it here, for a Hollywood system thing. But anyway, um, uh, and in, in that novel, it, there is an alien invasion, but the alien invasion in N.K. In Jameson's mind in the story is homogenization. It's the, it's the saming of the world, right? Making everything to, the same. That's the alien sort of mission is that we want the whole thing to be the same. And anybody who's out here trying to penetrate sameness by doing something original or different is the enemy. And so in this story that I'm adapting for television, uh, New York City is one of the last cities that's holding on to difference, holding on to idiosyncrasy as a culture and so the aliens target them because they're like, no, we can't have that happen, right? So, you know, so it's so great because like the, you know, the uh, voices of gender equity and queer equity and black equity and Latin, Latinidad, you know, all of that represents the things that the aliens hate. Um, so for me, like that's part of the Afrofuturism sort of like thing that's happening, which I, what I want to be a part of and I want to be, I want to see more of it, you know? Um, so I wanted to say all that. Um, but I also, um, as far as like, I, I'm a Capricorn. So I, I'm a taskmaster, I'm a game, I'm trying to like, you know, playing the game, how we gonna do it. So if there was an alien invasion, I also wanna say this before I say that. The last thing I wanna say about um, aliens, there's some, there's some conversations in the spiritual intuitive community that the aliens are here. That when you think about human behavior, there's certain human behavior on the planet that does things that are against the planet, right? It's like in, in, in argument against what is natural to the system of how this planet works. And so some people call whoever those people are alien or the people who are trying to sustain the beauty of the, of the, of the earth are the aliens, right? So there's, there's a lot of different ways to think about it, which is what Afrofuturism is. Um, but I think as a Capricorn, if there's aliens, an alien invasion went down, I was first trying to figure out, like April said, like, you know, who's the, who knows what's really going on? Who's the specialist? If I don't really feel like what they're saying is accurate, I would just go ahead, and, like, pack up my backpack, get my bike, my 10 speed, and just hit head to the hills and just see what happens. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. That is hilarious. But 
again, sounds like a very good plan. Um, and I think you you make a very interesting point about how we conceive of aliens, because that's, I mean, I know from my work, that's something that I'm very interested in, you know, something far beyond this idea of a spaceship, because I think that's probably the least likely way that it will happen. I'm sure it's one of the ways that it could happen, but there are many, many other pathways to this time, this place in time space. And so I'm, I'm, really curious about that. And I also really appreciate that sort of overlap or that interface between the scientific and the spiritual. And, and just, you know, when we start talking about quantum theory and the fuzziness and the weirdness and all of the stuff, and then these things kind of, you know, the Venn diagram kind of, you know, closes in. Um, so before we um, close out, we do have a couple of questions. Um, this first one, um, I'm going to, oh, Javon, I'm sorry. You said you're going to need to, okay. Um, if we lose you on camera, then um, we'll still have you on audio. And I want to definitely, you know, thank you for being here, but please stick with us. Um, and let's see. For the two actors, um, what does it feel like to work on one of these films and immerse yourself in the world of the film. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, well, we shot this a while ago, but um, what's great about it is um, it's nice to have the elements. Like I remember when we got the prop for the uh, like antivirus and uh, someone had made that. And what was kind of cool, she, she lived with her mom at one point and it was like midtown Manhattan, which is like all all those high rises were apartments that like didn't have running water all the time. And I think about that all the time. Acting is so much imagination anyway, even as realistic, realistic as it is, like you're here, you're on location, you're actually street. He's a real medical expert at this place, but there's still like, I'm not really in this situation. None of these people, this is. situation where we're really stretching the limits of what I see around me, what it's, it's just a really, it's fun. It's fun to, uh, where and, and, and for me, it's also about trying to make it as quotidian as possible. Like when she's her virus on her program and she has a mysterious kind of flu herself at the same time, like still a person and the crazy situation because that and so that's that's what's fun about like yeah the unreality reality of of this kind of world cuz this really speaks to beyond the experience for actors you know, as, as sort of storytellers, um, the power of having representation. ...meeting that has to do with her work, her research, and she's late for the meeting. And we, we shot a scene on the street where she's running to get to this um, high rise that's in Harlem on... It was... Uh, it was summertime, I believe. It was definitely warm outside. 
And we were shooting in the middle of Harlem in the middle of the day, so there were lots of people around. And I remember with these huge, this huge pointy collar, and her hair was amazing. And it was, you know, she had this huge, like, natural hair, and and there were these guys, and they were like, she looks like a superhero. And it I mean, they saw the camera, so they knew we were shooting, but it was just like the sight of her in this way, doing this thing, really moved people on the street. And for me, you know, I, I love New York. On the street in New York, because that they will, if it's if it's not good, they, they will let you know. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah. And if it does work, they will let you know that is for, for me. feel like to work on one of these films and immerse yourself in the world of the film? Well, you know, um, the beautiful thing about Keith is he's very thorough. Read-throughs and if we had any questions about what was going on, because I was like, what the hell, man? Uh, uh, what, what am I supposed Keith had the answers, you know, and we we asked the questions and we had a great team of actors who we could work off of. Um, but yeah, it was it was. I, the actor, couldn't get in front of the story. Keith has that, and we haven't done anything else. So it's one of those things. I couldn't get in front of the story, so hopefully the audience couldn't get in, in front of it. Well, all right, Keith, well, we need to finish this up, man. So I see what's going on, you know, and, and I, you know, it's one of those things as actors never... All the, the whole team of actors were trying to figure out this relationship, what's going on, what happened to this guy, what's going to happen to that guy, what happened to him, you know. So uh, I had, I knew some of the actors and then I was fans of, you know, the other actors. So it was great to work with this team of actors. We can be on a break drinking, talking, and Sterling is still working it out. He's just like, man, this brother don't, he don't take a break, you know. You can't just come in like, oh man, well, I learned my lines and I'm hit by Mark. No, <laughs> absolutely not. You're going to have to be in it. So for me, it was a it was a beautiful team that that Keith assembled, and um... that we need to wrap really quick. I want to ask you, Seth, really quickly. Um, what if? Uh... Keith. Uh, hit it right on the head, and that is get out of the way. Any anybody that can come here, right, is way. This Air Force is scrambled or whatever, and they eventually, thanks to human characteristics.